Greetings and salutations, everybody. I'm Arnold, also known as Murder of Birds, and I'm joined by Kalaxin, and we are here to present the second annual Oscars, a Ruby Volume 8 award show. We are so happy to be with you all here tonight to celebrate Kirby's work on Ruby Volume 8. We want to acknowledge everyone who has brought this volume to life bigger and better than ever before. For this year's Oscars, we have more categories than ever in order to show our appreciation to the directors, writers, voice talents, animators, designers, editors, storyboarders, modelers, camera, lights, VFX, rigging artists, compositors, mocap, and even the musicians. We have a lot of surprises in store for this year, but I'll let you know two out of the three right away. This year, we did a ranked voting system, so the choices made by the community would be weighted more fairly. We had over 10 nominees in some of the polls, but remember, we're only going to read out the top five nominees in alphabetical order. So if a character or piece or other item is missing, rest assured it was most likely on the poll. It just wasn't verbally re-announced in this video. We're also excited to reveal that we have many of our peers from the Ruby community joining us to present tonight's awards. And I just want to say thank you so much to everybody who joined in making this year's Oscars far better and probably the best that we've done from last year to this year. I've been looking at everyone's category submissions over the last few days and I swear y'all are gonna love it. This is one of, if not the most ambitious crossover in Ruby history. Excluding Ruby itself and its fairy tale and myth character crossover, of course, and definitely one of the biggest YouTuber crossovers I've ever seen anyway. Speaking of which, since we aren't gonna split the revenue 25 different ways, we decided <laughs> to donate any ad revenue, super chats, etc. to Extra Life benefiting children's hospitals in the United States and Canada. Rooster Teeth participates in this every year, so I can't think of a better way to honor Kruby tonight than to support a cause that Rooster Teeth partners with on an annual basis. That's enough from us. We thank you guys so much for your patience. Sit back, relax, and without further ado, let us begin the Oscars, a Ruby Volume 8 award show. Hello everyone, I'm Raijin Rising here to present to you the first category of the Ruby Volume 8 Oscars. For those of you who aren't familiar with me, I have been in the fandom since about the very beginning of it, but only since the off-season between Volumes 6 and 7 have I really started contributing to it, at least in the form of YouTube videos. So in that time I've done video essays, a complete restructure of the first four volumes of Ruby's store to the format that we are more familiar with them nowadays. Party amount of shit posts, even an AMV. I've done reaction videos, but most recently for volume eight, chapter reviews episode by episode. I am nowhere near as familiar or established as many of the faces that you are about to see throughout the course of the show, but like this award show, I am just getting started. So to kick things off, enough about me, the first category of the night is Best Environment. For Best Environment, a heck of a lot of work goes into the final product that the characters live in on screen. What is needed in the script gets concept art, which might get a matte painting, it gets 3D modeled, a heck of a lot goes into the composite that looks much, much, much more like what we as the viewer actually sees, and from there on it's camera work and even the sound design. With that all being said, these are your nominees for best environment. The central location. People enter from Atlas and Mantle on one side.
and leave on the other side with a one-way ticket to Vacuo. The end credits island. Monstra. This game is not yours to win, Cinder. It's mine. Schnee Manor. Oh, you've picked a fine time to- Not another word. We're coming in. Things are already bad enough after what you did to father. Now you want us to harbor fugitives too? Our family has a reputation. That's what you're worried about? Your reputation? I'm just saying that we've already lost all the house staff, and mother locked herself in her room. The Winter Vault Flower Field. And the Oscar for Best Environment goes to... Monstra. I've been thinking about what you said. If it's a lie, and I took that lie to Salem, the punishment would fall on my head before yours. If what you said is true, and I use the password myself, well, I don't know what happens when this thing activates. So let's see if you're bluffing. I can totally see it. And I gotta say, my choice, my choice for best environment didn't even make the top five. As you'll go through the night, you'll see the top five are being read. And my choice for best environment was the Tundra from chapter four. The Tundra is specifically the set that Ying and... Ren have their argument in. The setting does so much for that scene. And, you know, as I was saying with the camera work, there's 360 degrees, if I'm not mistaken, I'd have, to go, I'd have to go back, but there's 360 degrees of that set that you see. I think maybe even in as little as one shot, you see the entire tundra. And the way that the characters are immersed in it, you know, I'd say the sound design has a lot to do with too, but it just felt so rooted in that moment. I, I really love the way that everything went in to really put the viewer in that scene. As for Monstra though, gotta admit, I totally get it, it totally deserves this win. You know, we are seeing a new set of Monstra almost every time we're in Monstra. We start out with the premiere episode of Volume 8 with Cinder and Neo walking through it. Neo just kind of, what, what did she get herself into? You know, we see the jail cell, we see the relic room, we see all the way up through the very finale, once Monstra itself is destroyed, we see Salem reamalgamating herself in what I believe is a deconstructed set from earlier on. But Monstra completely redefined what a location in Ruby is. It is Salem's mobile command center for Volume 8. It's a grim and a location, and it does so much for Salem. So yeah, it deserves this win. So that about does it, but as you are aware, I am the first of many presenters for this year, so on to the next, and on to the next category. Good evening Ruby fans, my name is Larissa and I'm Shino. We are both YouTubers and Twitch streamers and I've been making Ruby content since Volume 4. And I've been making Ruby content since the Red trailer. I upload gaming videos and Ruby reactions to my YouTube and I stream a variety of games on Twitch including Hollow Knight, Sona Fire Strikers and Pokemon. I also do cosplays, I'm most known for my Volume 4 Ruby cosplay, you can see my photos on my Instagram and you can find me on all my socials as Nerds of Oz. 
I mainly stream on Twitch, currently playing Animal Crossing Final Fantasy XIV Phasmophobia, and soon Assassin's Creed Valhalla and then Spider-Man Miles Morales on my YouTube, as well as the odd Ruby video. You can find me on my socials as SheNoobTTV or just SheNoob on YouTube. We are honoured to be presenting the category of Best Lighting at the Oscars this year, for which Creepy has done an amazing job during Bully Mate. The lighting in Ruby has been one of the greatest marks of improvement in the show throughout the years, with Volume 8 being no exception. Lighting is one of the biggest components that conveys mood in any form of media, and in a volume as moody as Volume 8, this is especially important. The lighting this year has encapsulated the emotions of each scene beautifully, and we are excited to be presenting this award today. Now, without further ado, here are the nominees for Best Lighting. Ironwood's Ultimatum. I have always promised to defend this kingdom. It's technology, it's future, from those who would see it destroyed. Our enemy is crippled, but one individual still denies Atlas its salvation. The protector of Mantle. Nuke Aftermath. Penny overlooking Atlas. The Tundra Argument. I hate to break it to you, but that's part of being a huntsman. Are you kidding? We don't know the first thing about being huntsmen. We clearly weren't ready. Guys, stop it! Were we not ready when we saved Haven? When we took down a Leviathan? We got the lamp to Atlas! And then we lost it! And after that, when we had to make real decisions, we got every single one wrong. I'm not going to pretend like we did everything perfectly. But if we'd done nothing, things would be even worse than they are now. How could they possibly be worse? We are stuck out here while Salem has the lamp and Oscar. We've got no plan, no army. Weiss's room and storm. The city won't stand a chance unless we stop it. It's massive. Way bigger than a Leviathan. What can we even do? Penny launched Amity, and our message went out. Do we just wait for someone to come? If they even come. How did it all get like this? And the Oscar for best lighting goes to Nuke Aftermath. Woohoo! Yay! <laughs> Congratulations to that scene. Did did anyone respond? No. Well, she'll come back. In the interim, we need a plan. Plan. The plan hasn't changed. I'm going to rip the maiden power out of Penny Polandina. Because you're going to bring her to me. Um, I think we can all agree that the nuke itself was quite an incredible visual element of this volume. Something we certainly haven't seen in Ruby before. And then all of the scenes following that in the aftermath, the lighting really helps to convey this post-apocalyptic atmosphere. Congratulations to Creepy and everyone who worked on lighting in Volume 8. A well-deserved win for this scene. And all around congratulations to all of the nominees as well. Hi, my name is Erin. You may also know me as Puns of Damage on YouTube. I was a Ruby reactor for Volumes 4 through 8. And I started watching the show all the way back at the end of Volume 1. Gotta love getting into a show right before the hiatus. <laughs> I am a Twitch streamer. I like to stream RPG and story heavy games. I like to cry about them. I am probably most known for crying about Pierre and Ecos. I have cosplayed all of Team Ruby. I have cosplayed way too many Ruby characters. And I am most known for cosplaying Pierre and Ecos because I am predictable. So, Making a show is a very lengthy and collaborative process, and one of the overlooked aspects that can really give a shot the extra push is the visual effects. Now, this season had no shortage of visual effects, with the post-production team pulling out all of the stops to give us terrifying sequences with the Hound, to the sheer mystery and mysticism of Ambrosius's domain. With this in mind, the nominees for Best Visual Effects are... 
monstrous death. Nora overcharging. Nora, wait! <laughs> I can't! The nuke. Do it. Winter's anime slash. The Winter Maiden. You chose nothing. This was a gift. <laughs> and the Oscar for best visual effect in Ruby Volume 8 is... The Nuke. What's the status of our nuke? I think we can all agree that the episode was a heart stopper in more ways than one and everyone, both the characters and the audience included, were hit with emotional blow after blow after blow after blow after blow until we all longed for death. And what better way to kind of kick off all of the heart-wrenching moments of that episode in all of its majesty than with a sequence absolutely devastating in its calmness and its silence. Congratulations to all of the nominees. It was really, really hard to pick between all of them. It was such an amazing volume post-production wise and story wise, but visual effects really just have been kicking it off. Everything has come such a long way since the early days of volume one. And I cannot wait for you guys to see where it goes in the future. Sal, you, Stations! I'm Taylor McNee, and I have the pleasure of being the voice of Penny. I'm a voice actor, a 3D artist, an author, a YouTuber, and a nerd. I was Kruby for the first few seasons of Ruby, where I made 3D assets, I did art direction, and environments. You know who made Nora's pancakes? I did. Torchwick's cane and hat and cigar, Ruby's headphones, Velvet's camera and glowy copycat weapons, Sun's nunchuck guns, dorm rooms, ballrooms, ships, city streets, all the lamp posts and trees and benches and stuff, and so many other things, but mostly the pancakes. That was me, that was me. You can find me over at the Simply Beta channel where I'm obsessed with beta fish and fish tanks and aquascapes and aquatic plants and I really go um, in depth into my hobby. You can also find me over at the Tabby Tabaxi channel where I dance and I'm gonna be getting into my VR headset and rhythm games and streams and stuff. Thank you so much to Arnold and Kalaxin for inviting me to present a category in the Ruby Volume 8 Oscars. Concept art is a critical part of the creation of an animated series. It's what communicates the vision of the directors to the rest of the art team. It serves as a reference or a blueprint for artists to work with to create characters, environments, props, any digital asset, even communicating moods or feelings of specific scenes. It's one of the foundations of telling a story in a visual medium like an animated series. These are the nominees for Best Concept Art. Ambrosius. The Bridge, Monstra.
Mountain chase scene. Penny overlooking Amity. Silver eyed Faunus. Oscar for best concept art goes to Penny Overlooking Amity. Congratulations! Community voted very well. I approve of that wholeheartedly. This small pause where Penny stops and she looks at this symbol of hope in the night sky and we feel good for a minute was a lovely, peaceful moment before it all came crashing down in the episodes to come. Thanks so much to Arnold and Kalaxon for having me on this season's Ruby Oscars. <laughs> Hello, distinguished guests. Today, I have the honor and pleasure of being one of the many hosts for today's special event. Let me introduce myself. If you don't know me, I'm Lady Stardust, but you can just call me Star. I got into Ruby about four, maybe five years ago, and I've only just now caught up for this volume. It's been amazing to take part of the community events and this especially. It's been so much fun to join in on the discussion and the theorizing and the waiting, the agonizing waiting for next volume. You may remember me from crying over Roman's death all those years ago and more recently to being the number one Ironwood fan. When I'm not screaming over Ruby or other shows and movies that I like to watch, you can usually find me on Twitch trying to survive in Skyrim or trying to not die in multiple video games. I think a pretty accurate way I describe myself is a professional fangirl and screamer of screams. <laughs> when I'm not screaming at screams, usually I'm either dyeing my hair or changing up my look completely. And speaking of looks, from its inception, Kruby has placed great importance on character design. And these character designs are really cool and they've inspired thousands of people all over the world to cosplay and to dress up as our favorite characters. From the jump, Ruby had drool-worthy character design, hair, makeup, outfits, and weaponry. It really has become part of the Ruby signature, just like with the plot, with the animation, and with the music. And over the years, this signature has evolved. We've seen characters get new looks, new haircuts, like my favorite, Blake's little bob. And with these character design changes, Kruby has used it as a plot point and as a plot device to show character development and character growth. These are the nominees for best redesign. Emerald. Cinder. You're here! I knew you'd come. Quiet. Mm. Hazel. Go! Now! Mercury. Back you up. After what I just told you. Those are Salem's new orders. And I know better than to disobey Salem. But look, even if what he said was true, we can't stop Salem. You told me yourself. Hazel tried. He failed, and he got in line. Nora Scars. That was pretty awesome. <sighs> Nora! I'm so, so sorry. Winter. Winter. Sir? Until Penny either responds or is standing in front of that vault, we cannot assume her status. Take the Aesops. I want constant updates. And the Oscar for best redesign goes to... Winter! Congratulations to Winter. This one was so well deserved and it was my personal favorite pick. This redesign 
took one of the coolest characters and made her even cooler. This volume showed us so many things in character design that we hadn't seen in previous volumes, and Kruby knocked it out of the park with this one. Thank you, Kruby, for working so hard on something that so many people toss to the side and forget. Character design is one of the best ways to show character growth and development, and this volume was chock full of it. So thank you to Kruby, and congratulations again to our winner. Good day, everybody! It is Klaxon and Hunter here presenting the award for best merch. You may have already seen me probably a little bit too much, to be honest, but if you don't know, Hunter and I make videos on my channel, Klaxon. We do reactions, discussions, analysis, theories on Ruby, but other anime and video games as well. We also make videos about Ruby merch, giving our thoughts to what's in the store, as well as showing off the pieces we've actually bought. So we are so excited to be announcing the award this evening. Not only did characters get new outfits this volume, but the fandom also got to dress up in some Ruby Volume 8 merch. Ruby merch is how we rep our favorite characters, from action-ready Winter and Penny, to <laughs> Metal Nora and Ruby, to stunning pieces for Junior and Salem, and occasionally Ruby Ramen Bowls. The design team definitely upped the ante this year. And don't forget about those pretty glasses and mugs either. You'll want those handy as we toast to the winner and, of course, the nominees. These are the nominees for best merch released in Volume 8. Ruby Action Figure Collection Ruby Glass Collection Ruby Metal Collection Ruby Mug Collection The Junior Salem Penny Ein Lee Collection And the Oscar goes to the Junior, Junior Salem Penny Ein Lee Collection. Congratulations to the design team in Ein Lee. It's no surprise that the Ein Lee Collection took home the crown this year. The wall scrolls were absolutely beautiful, and the shirts finally gave fans of Junior, or I guess what's left of Juniper, Salem, Penny, and especially Oscar, an amazing way to rep their faves. Or mourn their faves. It wasn't only the art in this collection, but the characters showcase that left an unforgettable impact on the fans. We can't wait to see what wonderful and baffling creations the merch team has in store for us next volume. I'm thinking a Shade Academy sunblock, or Blake Belladonna fish fillet knife, or an alternative reality tropical beach survival kit. Hello Ruby fans, hello Oscars audience. It's good to see you all. I'm Katie. I'm Megan. And we generally do a reaction channel that's Ruby, that's all things Rooster Teeth animation. We also have a horror channel. Yay! <laughs> where we do all things horror, and that's where you can see me jump out of my skin if you want to. Yes, Silver Screams. It's silver a, Screams. It's a good time. And of course, we have the obligatory podcast. We are part of Rooster Team Radio, where we team up with two other hosts, and again, talk about all things Rooster Teeth animation, all things Ruby. We have a very, very good time. We have been fans of Rooster Teeth since early Red vs. Blue. Yeah, it was like season three was what was going on when, when my older brother initially got me into it. And I've just, I've stuck with Rooster Teeth ever since. <laughs> and I think one of my friends bought the season one DVD from GameStop. Way that's back where, in the day. That's where I got it too. And that's how we started. So we've been here for a while, lucky enough to see the Ruby premiere at RTX, and we've been just in it to win it since then. And we are absolutely honored to be invited to participate in the Oscars and to present here. So thank all of you. Thank you guys so, so much. This oh, is so cool. We're so excited. And without further ado, we'd like to move into our first category. Memes. <laughs> Social currency internet hieroglyphics. That one thing that you say in real life on accident and then you have to spend the next 15 minutes explaining the context. Oh boy. Means <laughs> we know them, we love them, the internet generates them, and we have generated some fantastic memes for this season. Some of them came and went in the span of an episode, some of them stuck around for the long haul. And these are your nominees for best meme. Before After Ruby.
Bill, number one dud. <gasps> Read the sign, Bill. Read the sign! Why don't you ever just pay attention? You're in here late all the time, your co-workers... Remnant's Chew Toy. Oscar! Team Arcos. You can do. Let me choose this one thing. Trust me. Weiss ejected. Press launch. <laughs> And the winner is... Weiss ejected! If you lie back in the tube and press launch... This... I love this meme so much. Oh my god, 11 seconds of just laughing my face it's off. It's so, so good. and. It, like, the thing about this meme is, like, it's exactly what, like, it's the sort of thing where it's, like, memes can only exist because of the, the culture and the time and place in which they're created. A confluence effect. Exactly. Yes. And that's exactly what this particular meme is. And it's, we loved the scene when we first saw it. We yeah. laughed like crazy when we first saw it. And then Among Us has been the social game of the past year and a half especially since we haven't been able to be social. So seeing them stitch together in such a perfect way is just chef kiss material. Absolutely. Well done. Congratulations, Weiss ejected. Well deserved. Sirs and madams with Sterling. And Cheryl, hello. Thanks for letting us join you guys. Thank you, Murder Birds, for putting all this together for us. Indeed, welcome to the Oscars, you guys. We're super pumped to be here. Yeah, so just a little bit about Stars and Madams. We do a lot of uh, reactions to Ruby, obviously, and a few other things. We also do lots of gaming on Twitch and YouTube now. We've been friends for about 10 plus years. I've stopped yeah. counting after like, yeah. seven. So I lost <laughs> like, count. Your, your family after seven, it's just, you know, <laughs> cut it off. But yeah, I think that's uh, part of our dynamic for sure, is that we've all are longtime friends who met through music, through arts, through gaming. We like stuff. We know you like stuff. So we all share our stuff. Mm -hmm. That's how it goes. Yeah, the other thing that we do, I think, on our channel, it kind of makes us unusual is we do Ruby covers. We are a bunch of crazy musicians. Um, and so we've tried to put that to work for the community. So uh, if you're interested in hearing some of our stuff, you can visit our channel and see what we've covered so far. And we've always got stuff in the pipeline. So hopefully we'll have some more stuff soon. Absolutely. Good music is good music, no matter what type of media, film, TV, even a web series like this. Absolutely. I know that I personally was introduced to Ruby through the music even before the show. Mm -hmm. And I think that exceptional songwriting and exceptional performances are really what draws us in to this show so much. And these are the nominees for best song. Be strong and hit stuff. for every life. Friend. I heard a song once, it posed this point of view. Wishes made on stars are likely to come true. So here's my secret. At bedtime every night, I search the sky and hope to find a star would send a light. The sky is falling.
the truth. Scrub the dishes in the sink. No one said that you should think. Shine the silver, wash the clothes, and when you're finished, darn the socks. Draw my bath, fetch my slippers, fill my glass, and rub my feet. Hurry up, you're so slow. You're no good. I hope you know that your life is of no use. And the truth is that no one's ever loved you. And the winner is. Friend! Friend! <laughs> Do hugs always make you feel this warm? My wish came true The day that you appeared You called me friends An answered prayer A chance to share the world To be a girl Who finally felt sad at the same time but I feel like you know all Ruby songs that are the excellent ones are either super heartfelt or super a bop and this song kind of transitions between the two so very good choice fandom yeah, and it was the perfect ending for the volume just to encapsulate everything and just oh like you said the bop was just mm, it, we needed so it at the end so nice choice fandom salutations <laughs> Hello ladies, gentlemen, and others. My name is Dan, the voice behind that Kaito Dan, and before anything else, thank you so much to Arnold and Cal for inviting me on as one of this year's Oscar Award hosts. This is a fantastic way to celebrate the end of the previous volume, bring the fandom together, and also, most importantly, give love back to the massively talented people behind the show, The Crew Bee. Every single person involved in this show deserve awards of their own for their hard work, pure talent and dedication to this series that we all love, especially over this last year or so being the mother of all douche canoes. So yeah, thank you again to Arnold and Cal and thank you massively to every single person involved in this show, much love and respect. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the guy who makes all the bad puns on Twitter or on several RubyTuber live streams. Um, but I'm also a lifelong Ruby fan ever since the initial color trailers and from volume 2 onwards I've been making several Ruby content including episode reviews and reactions as well as countdowns, news updates and much more. I also react to several other Rooster Teeth works like Death Battle, recorded by Arazal and Ruby Chibi and just anything else that I have a fancy in like Nintendo Directs, State of Plays and Smash reveals. But today I'm here to present a few voice acting awards as an avid fan of the profession. Voice acting by itself is no easy feat as you're limited to just one part of your body to bring to life several unique personalities and characters of all shapes and sizes. And this year has expanded that challenge by many talents having to record their lines in unfamiliar territories like homemade booths, different studios, and if push comes to shove, their own wardrobe. Still, Volume 8 was home to some of the finest performances in the entire series, including many of the talented gents in this category, proving that there is a massive amount of talent in Ruby's long list of voiceover stars. These are the nominees for Best Voice Actor in a Supporting Role. Christopher Sabat as Dr. Again, Arthur Watts. Given what we're after, I've got all the motivation I need. Sadly, it doesn't make taking down Pietro's magical science project any less cumbersome. Oh, I trust you can come up with something. Oh, the trust is palpable. Dave Fenoy as Pietro Polandina. She is right, Pietro. We have to remember the big picture. I don't care about the big picture! I care about my daughter! I lost you before. And you're asking me to go through that again? No. No. I want the chance to watch you live your life. Jason Liebrecht as Crow Bronwyn. But the thing that really stings, for the first time in a while, I thought, maybe, maybe I could be around somebody, anybody, without my semblance making it complicated. 
And now, it just feels like a childish dream. Gone. Like everybody else. Mick Lauer as Marrow Amin. You call this saving Atlas? Doing Salem's job for her? I believed in you! I thought we could work towards something better. But now you're throwing it all away. Do you even believe what you're saying anymore? Do any of you believe in anything? I used to wear this rank with pride. Now I see it from what it really is. A collar. Shannon McCormick as Ozpin. I'd like to express again that this is my burden to bear, not yours. His grudge is with me. No, it'll be even worse. He's holding back with me, I can tell. I understand, I do. But you've done so much already. The least I can do is give you a break and try to get us out of here. And the Oscar for Best Voice Actor in a Supporting Role goes to... Chris Sabat as Dr. Arthur Watts. Congratulations. I said I had Penny under control, not that I could telekinetically force her to do whatever I want. What? I implanted a virus in her, you dimwit. She's on a set path now. At least she should be. As much as I hate to admit it, there seems to be some part of her capable of resisting. Regardless, it's only a matter of time before her mechanical body succumbs to the virus. She'll open the vault, then she'll destroy herself, and our little penny problem will be... Yeah, I think that's a, a more des more than deserving winner. Uh, you'll probably hear me say this a lot in these categories. Any people nominated for these awards could have easily won it. They've had some fantastic performances over the course of this volume. Uh, Chris Sabat more than deserved to win it himself. It just He's been on fire, uh, pardon the pun, given the last episode, um, with uh, his performances as Watts over the whole volume and beyond. Um, obviously, like, the standout performance is going to be that mwah, chef's kiss of a rose against Cinder midway through the volume. Just a fantastic scene that really showed uh, Chris's talent at giving such charisma and vitriol and just arrogance in that kind of, like, bravado voice of his. He's a top-tier talent in the world of voice acting by itself, and that quality just showed immensely in that scene. So, yep. Yeah. Chris Sabat, you deserve this award most definitely. Congratulations again. Next up, we have Best Voice Actress in a Supporting Role. Like their male counterparts, the nominees in this category offered up plenty of noteworthy performances that showed quality acting can be found beyond the focused faces and major characters, further enriching in scene and oftentimes stealing it altogether. Be it moments of raw passion that gripped our hearts, or brief supportive comments that lifted up our spirits before the next moment of pain. These leading ladies showed great skill at making even the smallest of roles leave the biggest impacts. These are the nominees for Best Voice Actress in a Supporting Role. Anaris Quinones as Harriet Bree. I really had you pegged as the most level-headed of the bunch, but I guess you're just as naive. Feelings don't matter. The job matters. When you lose someone on your team, you move on. Replace them. Like Mara replaced Tortuga and Winter replaced... No! Aaron Zek as Blake Belladonna. I know you don't always know what to do, but that's never stopped you from doing something. I was like that as a girl, but time and... A lot of other things took their toll on me. Why do you? Barbara Dunkelman as Yang Xiaolong. All of this endless death, because something bad happened to you once upon a time? Nobody gets a fairy tale ending. Everything I've lost, every person I've lost, is because of you. And who is it I've taken from you, girl? Summer Rose. My mom. Kara Eberly as Y. Schnee. Snowshoe Shipping is an SDC subsidiary, meaning all the drones here report to the company, not the general. The pneumatic tubes allow for dust refined in the crater to be sent straight up to Atlas. We just need to find the one for the military base. Are there any buildings in Atlas that your family doesn't own? 
<laughs> that isn't relevant at the moment. Caden Jensen as May Marigold. Once Robin learned about Amity Tower, she wouldn't shut up about it. Wherever she is, I'm sure she would want us doing what we can to get it up in the air and get the world talking again. Besides, Fiona's got your friends helping out in my stead. Between our secret weapon and my semblance, you all couldn't be in better hands. And the Oscar for Best Voice Actress in a Supporting Role goes to... Aaron Zek as Blake Belladonna. Congratulations. I know you don't always know what to do, but that's never stopped you from doing something. I was like that as a girl, but time and a lot of other things took their toll on me. And then I wasn't sure if that kind of girl could actually survive in the world. Until I met you. It was a little strange at first because you were younger, but I've always looked up to you, Ruby. And I still do. Again, just like the ladies... All of them in this category, just fantastic performances around, especially uh, for me personally. I really love the performances for Mineris and Caden, just absolutely top draw stuff that really made me invested in their characters. The same can be said for all the ladies in this category. They more than deserve their nominations, let alone the possibility of winning. Uh, as for Aaron, just fantastic performances all around. She's really showing uh, now that she's lifted off some of the weight of Adam on her shoulders that uh, Blake can be a very sincere, very supportive character. We got that fantastic moment with Ruby that showed that underneath all her own stress and strife, she can be the support that other people need. Um, and obviously that scream is going to live long in my head uh, when Yang fell. That's going to be like one of those standout lines and performances that's going to live long in the memory. And that just shows that Aaron just absolutely kills getting right down to the heart and emotion of a scene. Just a fantastic performance. Just an all-around brilliant showing for Ms. Zek. Congratulations. We now move up a level to Best Voice Actor in a Leading Role. In a year that has tested themselves away from the mic just as much, if not more, than their character's thrilling arcs have made them in front of the mic, these actors over the course of the whole volume took charge with consistent grade A performances, further proving their genuine award-winning talent, be they seasoned veterans or relative newcomers to the acting scene. Whether it was performances that made the pain of suffering sting all the more, further celebrated moments of massive growth, or just entertained us over every bump on their rise and falls, these lot made sure to give every scene task their way their very best. And I can say in full confidence, mission accomplished. These are the nominees for Best Voice Actor in a Leading Role. Aaron Dismuke as Oscar Pine and Ozpin. You see, that is why she came for you. Because she could make you believe that this is what you needed. This is what you deserve! Yes! But Oscar, the people of Atlas, Remnant, you haven't done what you've done for justice. You've done it for yourself. Because she pushed you to think it would help you. Help. Has it? Jason Rose as General James Ironwood. I have one bomb. That's all it will take. If there is no mantle, then there is no reason for you not to work with me. Neither of us wanted to come to that, but one of us is willing to do it. If anyone tries anything other than what I've ordered, Mantle is gone. You have one hour to respond. Miles Luna as Jean Arc. You're right, Ren. I, I did cheat my way into Beacon. And I'm glad I had people around me to help me see that I was bigger than that mistake. You've got people around you, too. You don't have to force yourself to be strong. The more you hide from what you're feeling, the more alone you're going to feel. No Neef Ohm as Lai Ren. And by keeping her from opening the vault for Ironwood, we're just trapping the whole city for Salem. People are going to die because of us. So what, we should just give Ironwood what he wants? Abandon Mantle? 
You think Alice is still going to be able to float to safety now that she's here? I don't know. But these aren't the kinds of decisions we should be making because we have no idea what we're doing. Okay, both of you, cut it out. I'm just saying what nobody else wants to. We're in way over our heads. Ruby is barely more than a kid. I'm just an orphan from the middle of nowhere. Ren, I am- You cheated your way into bacon! William Orendorf as Hazel Reinhardt. Stop lying! <laughs> Salem can't be killed! When she came for me, I killed her over and over again. The longest she was gone was only a few hours before she put herself back together. When I couldn't lift my arms anymore, she showed me that through her, I could have the vengeance I needed. And the Oscar for Best Voice Actor in a Leading Role goes to... Jason Rose as General Jane Zionwood. Congratulations, good sir. Hello, Penny. I'm worried for your safety. Tell me where you are and I'll have you picked up right away. Atlas needs you, Penny. Salem is here. She's not going anywhere until you change your mind about Mantle. There's still a chance for Remnant to Mantle? Be You're still worried about Mantle? Remnant is doomed, Ruby. Unless we leave, Salem will destroy Atlas, and with it, any hope humanity has left. We need to think about the future. If she makes it through our defenses, everything that follows will be on your hands. Yeah, I think Jason more than deserved this award. Again, all of these guys could have easily have gone into themselves. I want to give big praise as well to Neef. I think he's really evolved over the years as Ren. Just fantastic stuff. And this volume, he really got to throw himself into some very unfamiliar but still entertaining uh, emotions and tones. And he absolutely killed it. Same for William and Aaron and Miles. They just all did a fantastic job. But as for Jason, I mean, the guy has absolutely brought the character to life in a way that I think few others could. He really knows how to balance between strong and intimidating versus fragile and paranoid. And this volume, we've seen the full gambit. We've seen him strong. We've seen him fearful. We've seen him paranoid. We've seen him uh, angered. We've seen him creepy and chilling. The guy has an absolute masterclass performance rate with every single expression and emotion. It's like I'm really, really respectful of Jason's performances over the years and this volume has just been in insane. One of my favorite performances from him is I believe an ultimatum where we got two different laughs from him over the course of like a few seconds and he, uh, Jason just twisted enough with enough of a more... Uh, like darker edge to it that it sounds so different so you can tell that this is the point when Ironwood has well and truly gone off the deep end. They're trying to save Mantle. <laughs> this has always been about Mantle, hasn't it? I need to make a call. Just a fantastic performance and Jason more than deserves this award. Absolutely fantastic job. Respect to you, good sir. And finally for me, we have Best Voice Actress in a Leading Role. Each of these immensely talented women made gold out of their character's most enticing and layered content in recent years, many of them having to branch out into vastly different material than what's attributed to their characters. And yet these lot took to these uncharted waters flawlessly, showcasing their range with equal skill to their already richly praised work in the past. From tender or fragile to bold or chilling, whatever the scene, these leading ladies did not hide away from the spotlight of center stage, but instead stood proud and showed us all why they earned that spotlight and why without them, many of our favorites lose a core piece of what makes them truly special. These are the nominees for Best Voice Actress in a Leading Role. Elizabeth Maxwell as Winter Schnee. I repeat, is anybody receiving these messages? Can anyone report status on the evacuation? I've never wavered in fighting the enemies of this kingdom. And I won't start now. Jen Taylor 
as Salem. The lies come out of you so easily. <laughs> Like-minded souls indeed. One of you is going to tell me what you know. I don't much care if it is you or Ozma. Either way, I'll finally have the relic. Lindsay We've Jones as Ruby Rose. We want you to make a new version of her, using her exact same robot parts. That was... curiously worded, girl. An exact copy of her would include the virus. An exact copy of her without the virus would cease to exist the second you make something else. And we kind of want to keep her around longer than that. Samantha Ireland as Nora Valkyrie. We've been together our whole lives, but I feel like I understand him less now than ever. And I don't know if that's his fault or mine. I don't actually know who I am. <laughs> Without Ren. <laughs> Pretty sad, huh? Taylor McNee as Penny Polandina. We'll cross the bridge, then go left, straight, right, straight, left, up, up, right, straight, right, right, straight, left, left. And my name is Penny. And the Oscar for Best Voice Actress in a Leading Role goes to... Taylor McNee as Penny Polandina. Congratulations. And after the launch, I'll return to help you all with the evacuation. But they need me here. Right? I guess we all have to do some things we would rather not. Taylor, just a fantastic job with a character that is usually very strict on the one note, chipper and bright eyed personality. But over the last two volumes alone, and in this volume especially, we've really seen the range of emotion in the character and in Taylor's performances. Um, again, any of the other ladies in these categories could have easily won them themselves, but I think Taylor just absolutely like shot to the stars and shine bright with how well she's able to explore Penny's uh, want of being able to make her own choices and all the desperation in her voice. We've seen her feel more human. We've seen her sad. We've seen her angry. We've seen her desperate for just attention, for respect. And just that one, like, tender moment where she's hugging Ruby and she asks, do hugs always feel this warm? At that moment, you really feel that Penny has finally gained the self of a humanity that she's desperately wanted. But at the same time, when you look back, you do, you do hear just how human she is. And Taylor just absolutely, just a fantastic performance, really making her so endearing so charming but also so bold and brave she is the protector of atlas she is the kind soul underneath the metal skin she is one of the most endearing sweet brave characters in the entire series and she went out with a performance that broke me in several ways and that just showed not only just like great uh writing for the character but the, the writing is elevated by taylor's beautiful, sincere, genuine performance and massive respect to Taylor. Much love to you and everyone has been nominated in these categories. Congratulations to all the winners and everyone who was nominated. Sirs and madams, it's Cheryl. And Sterling. We're back. Hi, we missed you. So this next category coming up, before we present it, we want to give a special shout out to the two people who made the voting process possible. They poured through over 50 scores over the course of Ruby this season to make sure that the best ones were available for you guys to vote on. And since everybody who watches our channel knows I suck at the English language, <laughs> we just want to give a shout out to Mitchell. Uh-huh, and Sarah. So thank you guys very much for your contributions. We hope we do you justice in this category. When it comes to storytelling, one of the most important aspects of TVs and movies is the score. The score is one of the most important threads when you're weaving a tale. And without the character even saying anything, the music going on in the background can make you laugh, cry, or even tell you what's going on in the character's head as they're doing the scene. And sometimes a piece of music in Ruby specifically will make you remember an exact scene, an exact moment, and an exact time in our character's journeys. Here are the nominees for best episode score. After the fall. <laughs> 
Atlantis. Penny's choice. Salutations! You made it! Where... What is this? I thought of you, and here we are. Oh, Penny. The Hound Reveal. Take... the girl. Take... the girl. Take the girl. Take the girl. Take the girl. Take the girl. Winter's Gift. And the winner is... The, the Hound, Hound Reveal. Reveal. What was that? It was a person. So this music added so much to that scene, I think, because there was a, it was just heavy going yeah, on. Yeah, there the was moment. a lot going on, and the music really brought you in and t showed you exactly what you need to pay attention to, and that is why scores are so, so important. And thank you to everyone in Kruby who worked on this amazing music for the show, because it really wouldn't be the same without it. Thank you, guys. See you next time. Hey everyone, I am Phoenix Knight, a fan of Ruby for over six years now, getting into it just after Volume 2 aired, and someone with far too many ideas about the show in his head. But a little over three years ago, I decided to put that to good use and started making review videos for each episode as they were airing, starting to make my ideas into theory videos, branching into analyzing the different characters and semblances, the different interactions in the show, so much so that it's branched into creating my own original characters set in the world of Ruby, and following the their ongoing story on my YouTube channel, even going so far as to create a tournament based around the Vital Festival with all of the different characters in the Ruby series, and this year even branching into using all of your original characters as well in their own tournament, something that will be decided through the ongoing original character contest that is currently going on on my channel until the end of May, so if you're watching this you might be, have a chance to get involved. But right now we are hosting the Oscars, and it is my my pleasure to host two of the categories this year. Thank you so much to Murder of Birds and Kalaxon for giving me this opportunity, and thank you to all of you who participated in this wonderful event. With every new episode of Ruby that airs, there's always this sense of wanting more after it's over, and Volume 8 took that to a whole other level. Following the events of Volume 7, each episode of Volume 8 built on the last, building towards that eventual conclusion of the overall volume. Every episode had so much work put into it, and it's so apparent that everyone who worked on it wanted it to be the best that it could be. I hope everyone who worked on it is proud of their efforts because we as fans couldn't be happier with the end result. I personally think that Volume 8 is one of, if not the best volume of Ruby so far, and I really look forward to seeing where everything goes in the future. But for now, we will see what episodes of Volume 8 are the best. These are your nominees for Best Episode. Chapter 9, Witch. I really don't know!
Go! Now! Chapter 10, Ultimatum. Operative Snee, let them go. You... what? Winter allowed them to go on board the creature to rescue their friend. And they never came back. They were our last chance. Now... Now I have... NOTHING! Chapter 12, Creation. Do hugs always make you feel this warm inside? Yes. Wow. More! We should probably make sure our theory works. <gasps> and start the evacuation. Ah, free to create and... No, oh, it's you guys again. We're not done with you yet. Ugh, fine. Chapter 13, Worthy. I knew your plan would be bold, but I never could have predicted all of this. At least not without a little help from Jin. I suppose I have all of you to thank for one last lesson. Sometimes, if you want to win, you simply can't do it alone. Ruby! Chapter 14, The Final Word. I have sacrificed everything! No! You have sacrificed everything else! You closed the borders. You squeezed Mantle until it broke. And the Oscar for Best Episode goes to... Chapter 14, The Final Word. This is honestly so fitting for how Volume 8 was structured, with the siege of Atlas starting at the beginning of the volume and culminating in everything that we saw throughout leading up to the finale. The hacking of Penny, forcing Team Ruby and everyone to get the Relic of Creation and ultimately abandon Atlas, trying to save as many people as they could. And the episode itself had everyone on the edge of their seats. Who is going to fall? Who is going to survive the volume? And don't even get me started about the cliffhanger at the ending. You want to talk about leaving us off so we wanted more? We ended with Wonderland, not knowing the fates of half of our main cast, and honestly, this episode should go down as one of the most iconic episodes in Ruby, and I'm really looking forward to seeing where this will take us in Volume 9. Hello everyone, my name is the Judgmental Critter. I'm super jazzed to be a part of the Oscars, and thank you all for voting and for watching this right now. Just thank you so much. <laughs> As for who I am, I do Ruby reviews, I talk about lots of different stuff like character designs, I make redesigns, I take a deeper look at cinematography, I have Ruby supplemental material, Ruby fan-made animations, and just a whole lot more. A real grab bag of Ruby stuff going on over here. <laughs> Ruby's got a massive cast of colorful characters characters, both figuratively and literally, and every year Ruby delivers us a bunch of brand new characters who always end up becoming our new favorites. With a show like Ruby who has a near constant rotating cast of characters, it's important for the fresh new faces to leave a strong enough impact to still resonate with audiences, even amidst the old well-loved classics. This category proves how a character can leave their mark on the show and end up beloved by fans, no matter how new they are to the series. These are the nominees for Best New Character. Ambrosius. Ah, seems someone has come to engage my creative wiles. All I'll say is it had better be worth it after my last project. A floating city? <laughs> A pedestrian. Fiona's uncle. V, we got another fight breaking out. Crap. Thanks, uncle. We'll handle it. 
Madam. You're to make sure the laundry is folded, the dishes are spotless, and the floors are clean enough to eat off of. Now hurry and get to your chores. The floor looks filthy. Roads. Seen you around, and I think it's safe to say you're not getting the most fair treatment. Yeah? I can't really blame you for what you're thinking. You don't know what But I'm... hurting them isn't going to make your life any better. You could run, but you're gonna be running for the rest of your life. The stepsisters. You missed a spot. <laughs> <laughs> and the Oscar for best new character goes to... <gasps> Ambrosius! <laughs> Congratulations! <laughs> I suppose I could do a little... Oh, add a touch-up. But if I do that, how much of the old penny would be my work and how much would be... her? Just coming up to the surface. This is all very exciting and very dangerous. Uh, I don't know what the results are going to be. We don't have any other options. We believe in her. Then ready yourselves to witness my artistry. Ambrosius is such a top tier best boy. I'm not too surprised he won. He almost immediately won me over with his flippant, carefree demeanor, which is a very fun contrast compared to Jin's more serious nature. From the way he rolls around swinging his feet back and forth playfully, or how he eagerly zips around as he starts envisioning his next biggest creation, it's Ambrosius's little mannerisms that really elevated him to be above and beyond. His design is like really striking and memorable, which is cool because the similarities between him and Jin is a lot of fun to see, but I like how he still looks uniquely himself, even though he shares similar color palettes and like concepts with Jin. Ambrosius really does feel like his own character, and that's really awesome. And it helps that his voice actor did just an amazing job. You can tell everyone who worked on Ambrosius had fun with him. The voice actor, the animators, the writers, everyone who worked with Ambrosius was having fun, and it helps make Ambrosius feel fun. His, 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 his energy is very infectious. <laughs> he's funny, he's personable, he's a little bit of a tricky trickster. <laughs> I, I love him. You no, know, he thinks real highly of himself, but also like, he's a cool guy. And I just, I just can't wait to see him again. I can only imagine his sassy personality would be a lot of fun bouncing off of the more grouchy, serious characters like Cinder and Salem. Let's give it up for Ambrosius one more time. Thanks again for watching and participating in the Oscars for Volume 8. Now then, let's dive into the next category. Hello again, Ruby fans. Hello again, Oscar viewers. I'm Katie. I'm Megan. And we are back with another category, and this one is near and dear to our hearts. <laughs> so let's take a moment and talk about the Grimm. Now, as we mentioned in our previous category, we are horror fans. She's a horror fan and I'm here for it. <laughs> and that means we love the Grimm. Your favorite thing that Ruby does is when it turns into a horror movie. Absolutely. That is, that is Ruby when it's at its finest, or at least more, most enjoyable to me, is when it goes full horror movie. And a peak factor in that is the Grimm, the monsters that roam the realms of Remnant. As always, we have some wonderful new Grimm, and if you've watched our channel, if you know us, you know that we like to nickname them. For example, the Wyvern is... Kevin! And the Leviathan is... Nessie. And of course, the Knucklevy is... Jim and Randall. Jim and Randall. <laughs> <laughs> Although I couldn't tell you off the top of my head which is which. Uh, Jim's the guy, Randall's the horse. I think that was it. That yes. was it. <laughs> because Randall had no dialogue, he just screamed. <laughs> Of course, Volume 9 has given us a bevy of incredible new Grimm to watch and name and fear, but mostly name. And of course, we would like to present the nominees for Best New Grimm. Senator. Why did they get more disgusting? I don't know if you can hear me. But I need you, Ruby. The Hound. Wait! It's using Oscar as a shield! But Grim aren't that smart. 
Ravagers. We can't go back. The portal won't last. Sulfur fish. And the winner is, can we get a drum roll? Smart Alec. <laughs> the Hound! Credentials verified. Click to proceed. I know. We love the Hound so we much. Love the I mean, in some ways, I had no doubt that the Hound was going to win. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the Hound was the standout grim of this season. And, of course, in keeping with our naming tradition, the Hound somehow went through four names for us. <laughs> Started as Ditto because he was a shapeshifter, turned into Krampus because he took away children, and then it became Soylent because Soylent Hounds are people, and John Doe because we don't know who's in there. So, any one of those works, but we love the Hound. Oh, so much. Um, I always appreciate, uh, again, when Ruby goes full horror movie, and also just the uniqueness of each grim that encapsulates, like, the horror of the world of Remnant. And we got that with the Nuklavi, we got it with the Apathy, um, and, like, the Hound, I think is, like, take I think the, the hound step in this evolution absolutely. of horror. It's it's taken that the horrifying elements of Grimm and taking it to its logical conclusion. Oh, I would say <laughs> logical next step. <laughs> That's true. Well, One fear not over yet. <laughs> One fear except the fear is Salem and it encompasses many. Yeah. So yes, congratulations Krampus, Soylent, John Doe, the Hound. You deserve this win. And thank you to everyone who voted. Thank you for inviting us on. We had a fantastic time. Thank you for watching. Hello, and once again, I am Raijin Rising, here to present to you the results for best male and best female character in a minor role. Though you would not find this category in the typical theatrical awards show, best characters in a minor role is really great to have so that every character, no matter what part they play in the plot, can get their due, can get their time and be awarded for it, when they might not be big enough to be considered for the supporting role category. You know, they may only get a couple lines, or they might be in only one or two episodes throughout the entire volume, but they make their mark on the story nonetheless, and that's worth considering. So to start, these are your nominees for best male character in a minor role. Ambrosius. So she isn't. I I'd love to meet whoever did this. Ah, uh, I see. There's something eating away at her. I'm, I'm guessing you think you have some clever plan to save her. Just know, I will give you exactly what you asked for and I don't want any complaining when it's not what you wanted. Blind Seaban. Miss Nee, I heard there was a patient here who needed my help. I... I am so sorry, Klein. It's my fault that Father... Please don't worry, my snowflake. It, it had nothing to, to do with you. And everything to do with Jacques. Mercury Black. Those are Salem's new orders. And I know better than to disobey Salem. But... Look, even if what he said was true, we can't stop Salem. You told me yourself. Hazel tried. He failed, and he got in line. Big guy's not gonna pick fights he can't win. Neither should we. Rhodes. How old are you? Ten. And you wanna be like us? You wanna be a huntress? Huh. <laughs> then we've got about seven years. For what? To train you for the huntsman exam. 
Tyrion Callows. Mm, so devoted to someone so incompetent. While well, the good doctor and I were advancing the will of our goddess, dismembering the very body of this kingdom, you were merely atoning for past failures. And the Oscar for best male character in a minor role goes to... Ambrosius. Well, everything appears to be in order. You were quite thorough. Disappointingly so. So, it's done. Yeah. Oh, and one last point of clarification about this central location of yours. Do not fall. Okay, and with that dire warning. As Oz said, he is quite the character. And honestly, I didn't think we would see him. We have the staff holding Atlas up, so clearly if the spirit in the staff is necessary to be seen, we need a good enough reason. We need to be okay with putting an entire kingdom's worth of lives at risk to be able to use it. And I think that ultimately it came out very well. And his voice acting is great, his animation is great. I love the animation that happens for the different relic spirits because they're floating and they have so many different particle effects and visual effects and so the animation that happens with them on top of already you know being different from a character who's rooted by gravity they're just so expressive regardless so it's always great to see them and of course for the rest of the nominees it was great to be able to see Klein again Mercury and Tyrion I have the sense that with Mercury and Tyrion their scenes in volume 8, or rather, their one scene at the end of, I believe, chapter 7. That is going to be so important when we get to the vacuo arc, whenever that is. Uh, that it's going to be so important to really remind ourselves that this is where their character arcs come from. This is where Tyrion is at. This is where Mercury is at. Because I feel like we're going to need to call back to this scene. But that's all I have about, really, to say for the male characters in a minor role. So now, these are your nominees for best female character in a minor role. Elm Adern. Don't do this! They're still evacuating in Mantle! Why can't you just let me do my job? Because you're our friend! And we won't let you go through with this! Fiona Time. No, Crimson, I need you and your team over in Sector 11. Mantle police are helping us clear the hospital, but they're gonna need backup. Huh. You're doing great, Fee. Robin would be proud. I feel like you should be doing this after flexing on the news like that. Jin. Jin. Why, hello again, old man. Did you have a question for me? Maria Calavera. Don't you think Penny has had enough people telling her what to do? <sighs> Prepare for launch. It's our Please. only option. She is right, Pietro. We have to remember the big picture. I don't care about the big picture! Willow Schnee. We, we have a generator near the edge of the estate. <sighs> so kind of you to join us, Mother. Believe it or not, I am above drinking in the dark. And the Oscar for Best Female Character in a Minor Role goes to... Willow Schnee. I can see it. It's outside Winter's old room. I... You can kill it, can't you? What is it doing? I'm... Not sure. It's acting strange. Why is it here? It doesn't matter. Just keep an eye on it so I can track it down. Right. Right. I gotta admit, I thought this category would be a toss-up between Willow and Maria. At least for me, I can understand Maria getting it after her fight scene in Chapter 5 against Neo being the only character in the history of the show to really, really give Neo a hard time. It was great to see Maria... Just have fun fighting against Neo of all characters. And at least for Willow, Mama Shnee definitely steals a lot of the scenes that she's in. I gotta say it. 
She's a lot of fun to watch in her own ways, and with volumes 7 and 8, she is the essential view into the broken home that is Shinny Manor, and getting to see Whitley in a new light especially too, a lot of that comes from Willow. Like, we'd known Weiss's relationship, we'd known Winter's relationship with her family for a good portion of the show, but now seeing it through Willow's perspective, I feel a lot more important than anything that we had really seen up until this point. And I loved seeing, especially as well, her uh, security cameras coming back for Volume 8, Chapter 8, The Fight Against the Hound. Really, really cool to see, you know, thinking in Volume 7 it might have just been there for that one moment to justify or explain that one thing, but now, no, it's really adding this extra dynamic, this extra element to the horror of chapter 8 and that was amazing and willow she's a she's kind of a meme too so she's got that going for her <laughs> but that being said that's it from me please enjoy the rest of the volume 8 oscars and i hope to see you around the fandom what is up people of the internet my name is freelancer ember and as you all know i'm a ruby tuber sort of i also love pokemon kingdom hearts various games and anime. I'm also a Twitch affiliate and I love to stream and hopefully I get to do more of that in the future. So as you all know, I'm also part of the Oscars but as one of the hosts and I gotta say, it's pretty awesome. Last year I did both when volume 7 ended and being this again now but and again as a host, I'll be doing funniest moments that happened in Ruby volume 8. Now Ruby has a lot of moments throughout the years, whether it be hurtful moments, happy moments, uh, moments that make you actually like connect with the character. There's one kind of moment in Ruby that helps us cheer us up and give us a good laugh. That's right, I'm talking about funny moments like I said before. From Ruby getting blown up back in volume 1 to Jean getting hit on by thirsty moms in volume 7. These are the nominees for funniest moments in Ruby volume 8. Jean walking away from Ren and Nora. Ha <laughs> ha! Uh, all water under the bridge, buddy. Ha <laughs> I'm, uh, gonna go see if Pi needs any help with Penny. Penny explaining Ruby's that. semblance. Do not worry. Ruby is capable of traveling at an extreme velocity from one point to another by breaking herself down to her molecular components, thus negating her mass and then reassembling them at the destination, theoretically making it possible for her to transport all of us in the same way, as mass no longer matters. Rock hitting Jean. Everyone! Ow! God! I'm, uh, gonna need your attention. Weiss gets vented. So how do we use this thing? It should be simple. If you lie back in the tube and press launch... <laughs> And the Oscars for funniest moment and Ruby Volume Eight goes to Weiss gets vented. Ow! Ow! Come on! That was a once in a lifetime experience. Ow! And I can see why. I and I'm sure many of you absolutely lost it when Nora just happened to hit the one button all the while Weiss was trying to explain how these shoots work. Thank you to everyone who voted for this year's Oscars, and thank you to the Kruby for keeping this show going. Honestly, I've been a fan of Ruby since the beginning. I was originally a Red vs. Blue fan back in high school, and then when I first saw Ruby, I immediately, like, became such a huge fan of it, as you can see from, like, my posters <laughs> and the many and many figures I've bought throughout the years. From the very beginning, we can see the transition from how it all started to right now, all the voice actors, all the animators, screenwriters, everyone is awesome. And I can't wait to see more of this in the future. And for the Ruby community, it's just such, such a fun thing being a, to be a part of. And I hope you all enjoy this as much as I do. Again, thank you all so much for voting. Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy, aka Jeremy Noir Productions. I'm so excited to be here with everyone for the 2021 Oscars for Ruby Volume 8. I've been a fan of Ruby ever since the end of Volume 2, and I can't wait to see what Kruby does with the rest of it. Now, my channel doesn't exactly have much Ruby content at the moment, but Cal and Arnold keep inviting me back for these things, so I'm sure I'll make some Ruby content.
sometime. When it comes to Ruby, one of the things that the fans love most, and arguably even the people that work on the show love most, is the characters and how they interact with one another. Whether it be a familial relationship, a platonic friendship that's as strong as any type of familial blood, or even a romantic relationship for you shippers out there. And so, let's bring attention to that. The contestants for Best Relationship Development for Ruby Volume 8 are... Emerald and Hazel. Go! Now! Hazel. Go. Penny and Winter. You were my friend. Thank you for trusting me with this. When you're gone, I won't be gone. I'll be part of you. Good. I'm glad. Ren and Nora. Why didn't you say anything? So we failed as a team, but we succeed as a team too. I was the one holding us back. Not John, not you, me. Well, you're wrong. All I do is make dumb jokes and smash things with a hammer. What? That's not true. <sighs> you put everything you have into what you do. You support everyone around you. You help without worrying about how it might hurt. And that's what I love about... That's why I... I love you. Ruby and Penny. I was the protector of Mantle. But now... I am much more than that. And I wish I was not. But you're still you, Penny. By becoming the Winter Maiden, you did protect Mantle. Thank you, Ruby. Weiss, Whitley, and Willow. I didn't forget you. Go! And the Oscar for Best Relationship Development in Ruby Volume 8 goes to... I'm not surprised in the least. It's Ren and Nora. When my mom ran from the Grimm and left me behind, you found me. We became Ren and Nora. But I realized on this mission apart, I don't know who just Nora is. And if I'm ever going to find out, then I have to do it alone. <laughs> because I've always loved you, Lyren. And that pretty head on your shoulder seems like it's doing a lot better. But I still gotta get mine sorted out before I can be the partner you need. Is that... okay? It's definitely okay. <laughs> I figured Ren and Nora were going to win. For me, they definitely were one of the best relationship outcomes to come out of Ruby Volume 8. It's very rare in media, at least in my opinion, to see a romance that actually comes out and says that these two people need to figure out who they each are as a person before they can get into a romantic relationship and force anything that could become something toxic. And it's just something that speaks to me very personally, and I'm definitely glad that everyone on Kruby decided to go that route. All I can say is, wow, this is amazing. Thank you again, RL Cal, and everyone else for giving me this opportunity on the Oscars. And if anyone from Kruby is watching, I'm probably fanboying on the inside because of that, but like, I'm just excited to be a part of the Ruby community. I'm glad I could be a part of this project. So yeah, have a nice evening, guys.
One of the best things about watching an ongoing series is seeing how different plot points are building towards eventual conclusions, only for those conclusions to end up being something completely unexpected. And Volume 8 had plenty of those. Seeing different things hinted throughout the volume, building towards an eventual reveal, and when it came time for that reveal to happen, it ended up being something much larger than what was expected or just something that blindsided us completely. As someone who makes different theory videos on the plot of Ruby, it was an absolute pleasure to watch everything unfold throughout the volume. These are your nominees for the best twists and reveals in Volume 8. Cinder Betrays Neo and Watts You should have never threatened me. And you should have never been born. Post credit scene Wonderland. The Hound is a Silver-Eyed Warrior. Take... the girl. 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 Watts hacking Penny. Even if Atlas falls. And the Oscar for Best Twist or Reveal in Volume 8 goes to... The Silver-Eyed Hound. Honestly, no surprise on this one, as it was probably the largest reveal in Volume 8, and the amount of theories and speculation in the Ruby community is a testament to that. For the first half of Volume 8, once the Hound was revealed, that it was a talking grim, and the amount that it was hyped up, being an experiment that Salem had worked on, the speculation of if the Hound was Summer Rose, or if it was going to be a character significant to our main protagonists, all of the different theories and ideas surrounding it culminated to the eventual reveal that the Hound was a silver-eyed warrior. This was an amazing plot point to put in the volume, and the best part about this twist slash reveal is it's not over yet. There is still more to build on with it, and I am so looking forward to where it is going to be taken in the future. All right, welcome everyone. We're Semblance of Sanity. I'm Caleb. I'm Jacob. And uh, we're brothers. We have a semi-healthy obsession for stories, uh, YouTubers. Uh, we love just getting into the emotion, the exploration of humanity, some passionate discussion, rambling, ranting, and then also just creating beautiful memories surrounding those stories. That's just what we live for. It is our jam, mm -hmm. but we do have a few titles, some self-proclaimed, some given to us by others. The first is, of course, we are dramatic narrators. Mm -hmm, indeed, and I am a notorious trivia master. Mm, yes, and and one of us, I'm not going to say who, is a published author. Mm -hmm. Go get his battle lines, check it out. Also, we are professional anime shillers of the highest quality and grade. Indeed. Uh, so I will, of course, take this moment and platform to shill Vinland Saga. Go watch it. It's incredible. It's a coming-of-age story filled with tearjerker moments and uh, brutality and, and humanity. It, yes, go watch it on Amazon. And we are hosting the best tearjerker category. Yeah. Over the years, Ruby has hit us with some of the most painful cliffhangers, backstories, and deaths, and red-headed suffering. <coughs> yeah. Oh, okay. But Volume 4, just shouting out here. What about the training video that Pyrrha left for Jean? Like, that 
that's such that's such a simple bit in episode two of volume four, but it just destroys me every single time. Can we just give a shout out to literally any time that home plays? I cannot listen to that song without crying. Yeah, that that will do it. That'll do it. These are the nominees for best tearjerker. Hazel's death. Penny's death. <laughs> Ruby and Yang's summer talk. You know what that means then. I wouldn't worry about that. That's what happened to mom. When I saw its eyes, I knew. Salem used to kill people with silver eyes, like Maria. But she's always wanted me alive. Vine's death. Yang Fallen. The Oscar for Best Tearjerker goes to... Penny's Death. But there is something you can do. No, I, I don't know where the others are, but why still give us time? Let me choose this one thing. Trust me. Yeah, well, makes sense. Well deserved. Uh, that's kind of to be expected of yeah. the five options that were there. I really only would put Yang's and Ruby's summer talk as being like up there meta wise as like one of the one of the contenders there because I mean, Penny's death. No contest. It's in no my real mind. contest there. Yeah. Like okay, <laughs> like yes, we got another redhead dying tragically. And Jean Thanks, was, Rooster Teeth. But 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 what can I say? Jean's involvement was a bit more extreme this time than last time. At least he got to be there. Yes, yes, Caleb. He got to be there, <laughs> and it wasn't just because he didn't block an arrow. But no, this time it's because he actually killed her. Oh my oh, god! Oh boy! Yeah. Yeah, I'm I, sure the trauma won't stack up on on him. No, 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 no. not at all. Oh my god! And, and as far as where things go into volume, like you know, nine, he's going to be without his crew, you know, in the void place with the island and all that. So that's going to be its own thing. Ugh. Well, yeah. Thank you for inviting us to the Oscars. And I'm sorry for dropping the uh, the yellow uh, letter all over the place there. But I mean, you know, it's like. A golden child lost in the void. Sounds very familiar, yeah? Yes, yes. Yeah. Just, a, just a little. Just a little? Yeah. Just a little. 
Hi everybody, my name is Tanner, better known as Blizzik, and I'm going to be presenting the award for Best Monologue. If you don't know me, I'm a writer, and I make video essays on the writing in all sorts of media, uh, mostly anime and a lot of Ruby, but I do talk about video games and movies whenever it strikes my fancy. Uh, I have a really big review of Volume 8 coming up on the horizon, and some even more fun stuff planned for after that, but for now I am just really, really excited to be a part of this totally awesome celebration of Ruby Volume 8. When it comes to fancy schmancy wordsmithery, Ruby characters are a mixed bag. Sometimes they're a little too lost in each other's eyes to do much besides bumble through their words, but other times they unleash a monologue so perfect you can tell that they've been practicing in the bathroom mirror for weeks. These speeches give these characters an opportunity to externalize their complicated inner worlds and advocate for their personal ideologies, and they get to be as dramatic as they want in the process. These are the nominees for Best Monologue. Ironwood's Ultimatum Speech I have always promised to defend this kingdom, its technology, its future, from those who would see it destroyed. Our enemy is crippled. But one individual still denies Atlas its salvation. The protector of Mantle. I know how much Mantle means to you, so I'm going to give you a choice. You can bring yourself to Atlas Academy and do your duty. Help me save as much of Atlas as I can, and Mantle will be left to fend for itself. May's speech to Team Ruby. No, see, you just don't get it. This is not a situation where everyone wins. Now you all can come with me to help in Mantle, or I can drop you off near the front lines if you still want to help Atlas. Your uncle and Robin can't save us. We have to choose. So choose. Ozpin's apology. I was recently reminded of an old fairy tale. A young girl flees the consequences of a choice. To a magical place. But... Having never learned from her initial failure, she only succeeds in spreading it. I failed all of you. I should have trusted you with the truth, and should never have run the day you discovered it. And I hope it's a risk you can take on me again. Ruby's speech to Remnant. My name is Ruby Rose. I'm a huntress. And if we've done everything right, then I'm talking to all of Remnant right now. Dr. Paul and Dina can explain more later. But right now, you all need to know that the Kingdom of Atlas is under attack. I know the idea of the Maidens and Relic seems, well, crazy. But I promise Professor Goodwitch of Beacon and Headmaster Theodore of Shade can verify all of this. They might even be able to help organize a way to fight back. But, sadly, General Ironwood can no longer be trusted. Watts's speech to Cinder. <laughs> oh, of course you are, because that's just what you do, isn't it? And how has that worked out for you? You stormed into Freya's room thinking you could take on Ironwood's top fighter and war machine. But you couldn't. And that machine became the Winter Maiden! Oh, and let's not forget your deal with Raven Brownwyn. Get all your enemies in one place so you'd have a shot at revenge! If only someone could have warned you against such a miserable idea! Oh wait, I did! And the Oscar for Best Monologue goes to... Watts' Speech to Cinder! But you pushed ahead, and you lost it when all you had to do was your job! You think you're entitled to everything just because you suffered, but suffering isn't enough! You can't just be strong, you have to be smart! You can't just be deserving, you have to be worthy! But all you have ever been is a bloody migraine! Alright, I was gunning for that one, so I'm very glad that the community is at my back. Yeah, <laughs> there was a lot of great monologues this volume, but I don't think you can compete with someone who knows he's right and just has nothing to lose. Not to mention Chris Sabat is amazing, and also I think it's just really, really satisfying to hear the sorts of things that the fandom has been saying about Cinder for years finally vocalized by a character in the show. 
So that was a really satisfying element of it, too. I want to thank all of you for your votes. I want to thank Murder of Birds and Kalaxon for having me at this wonderful community event. And of course, I want to thank Kruby for giving us another wonderful, wonderful volume. I am very excited to be a part of this, and I'm very excited to see you all again in Volume 9. Ta-ta. Hi, I'm Riga. This is... This isn't you, all right? What? Oh, one sec, one sec, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, <clears throat> sorry. Hi, I'm Rigo, and this is the Oscars, and I am ecstatic to be here. If you don't know me, since I'm kind of new around here, I'm a paper cutout that talks a lot about Ruby, as well as other things. I do crazy theories, like if you ever want to find out why Jin was human, then I can more than help you out with that. Not to mention I do reviews. At the moment we're going through Avatar episode by episode, and I'll be talking about some full anime series quite soon. I talk about movies a lot, we're likely going to start doing some movie based content on the channel. I just started a new and exciting thing where we're designing characters, and I'm working with my my audience to build the idea of a mirror universe in Ruby. And not to mention my big one, my Ruby Runs project where we run through the plot of Ruby in what if scenarios. We are currently several episodes deep into what if Jean died instead of Pyrrho. And let me tell you, it is quite an emotional ride. But we are not here to talk about me, we are here to talk about Volume 8, so let's get on to the award. When Ruby first started, it was sold to many on the fight scenes alone. The choreography, as well as the unique weapons and enemies, defined a reason to watch it all and helped get people on board with the show to start. These days, the characters and story have gone far beyond that point, and there's obviously a lot more to be invested in than just the fights. However, at the end of the day, it's good versus evil, right versus wrong, and eventually swords need to be drawn. When that happens, it's do or die, and as we all know in this show, dying is certainly a possibility. So, while it's no longer the main selling point of the series, it's still central to the outcomes of the story and the survival of our characters. With signature weapons, dust, aura, semblances, maiden powers, and more at their disposal, a fight in Ruby is always a fight worth watching. That being said, it's time to find out which was the best. These are the nominees for Volume 8's Best Fight. Everyone versus Ironwood. I have. Feels weird. Penny versus the Aesops. <laughs> Sailor versus Hazel. Knee Manor versus the Hound. What is this thing? It's just a grim. Just focus. Team Ruby and Penny versus Cinder and Neo. And the Oscar for best fight of Volume 8 goes to Everyone vs. Ironwood.
Ironwood certainly was one of the biggest hurdles that needed taking down, and it took more than a team to do it. From Emerald's master deception, Oscar tapping into his potential, Jean, Ren, and Nora going toe-to-toe -to -toe with perhaps the strongest combatant in Atlas, it was still only possible due to Winter's perfect execution and showing the true depths of her talent and combat abilities. Without all of them combined, there was little to no chance. A worthy winner for sure. Like with any fight, there was so much to balance here between all of the weapons and powers, not to mention needing a snappy runtime, and they pulled it off. Everyone had a moment to shine and a role to play, showing exactly why they're worthy of being where they are. A big congratulations to Kruby and the show for delivering across the board this volume, keeping the combat satisfying alongside everything else that needs to go into the story. A big thank you to everyone involved in bringing us this volume, and a huge personal thank you from me to Arnold and Cal for inviting me on to host for you all. I truly hope you're all enjoying the Oscars and appreciate what a huge undertaking this is. And until next time, my name is Rigger, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I hope I did alright. Hey, I'm Kelly. I'm Sani. And together we form the YouTube channel Zhao Long, where we do Ruby reactions, we do live streams, video essays, we also react to a bunch of other animated shows like The Owl House and Jujutsu Kaisen, and occasionally we dip into cosplay, hence all the chaos in the background up there. <laughs> uh, we have to say thanks to Arnold and Cal, Murder Birds and Kalaxon respectively for organising this and bringing so many Ruby content creators together and of course you guys for voting on all these categories. After such an amazing volume of Ruby, what better way is there to show our passion than being able to vote on our favourite categories and see who comes out on top? Ruby is known for its large cast of main and supporting characters that have only grown in number since Volume 1. In Volume 7 and 8 in particular, we have seen a whole host of characters introduced, including both male and female characters, many of which have had a great impact on the plot and the fandom as a whole. These are the nominees for Best Male Character in a Supporting Role. Okay. Arthur Watts Given what we're after, I've got all the motivation I need. Sadly, it doesn't make taking down Pietro's magical science project any less cumbersome. Oh, I trust you can come up with something. Oh, the trust is palpable. Maro Amin. They might still be alive in there! I gave them their window. We can't wait any longer. Would you say the same thing if it was your sister inside? Are you gonna tell her what you did to her friends? Pietro Polandina. We made decent progress on construction and fuel collection. All potentially manageable, but uh, <laughs> Amity was designed so that it couldn't launch itself without first being granted clearance from General Ironwood's terminal. Crow Branwen. There might be a better way. I'm telling you there isn't. Well, this isn't just about you. It's about everyone. I'm going straight up to the Academy, and I am ending this. Or we fail and people get killed. He deserves this! Wetley Schnee. We don't just have perks. Hmm? We have the company. The people you mentioned in the crater. They need a way out, right? There are rows and rows of cargo ships just sitting in the hangars because of the embargo. And our own automated drones. Like the ones at Snowshoe Shipping. We can order as many as we need to pilot our ships down to the crater and get people to safety while the Grim are occupied with the General's forces. And the Oscar for Best Male Character in a Sporting Role is... Arthur Watts. You have everything you need? Oh, believe me. This is everything I've ever wanted. You deserve this, Arthur. We'll be back. Congratulations, Arthur. <laughs> You're dead. <laughs> You're dead. Sorry about it. But to be absolutely fair to Arthur, I thought this was his best season. Yeah. It's such a shame that he had to end it by being dead. But went out on a high and on fire. Really did go out on a high and the <laughs> I'm going to say talk, but we all know it wasn't a talk, but the talk that he had with Cinder uh, and the way that he really managed to like dig down into her inner demons, whether he meant to or not, I thought that was a really standout performance for Arthur in that situation. So I think this is well deserved. 
Ruby as a show would not have come as far as it has today without its diverse range of female characters, many of whom were given a chance to shine in a volume that took us to some really dark places and put these characters to the test. The nominees for Best Female Character in a Supporting Role are... Blake Belladonna May Marigold. It's chaos at the crater. Atlas has its army, but Mantle only has us. People are dying. People are dying here too. Don't you have family in Atlas? No. Mantle needed me. And to the Marigolds, that meant I wasn't their son anymore. And I made sure that everyone knew that I wasn't their daughter. Neapolitan. Neapolitan, was it? Now isn't the time to hold grudges. No. She's a right to be angry. I know I haven't upheld my end of the bargain. I'm sorry. I will get you Ruby Rose. Today. But to do that, I need to ask the lamp a question. <sighs> Weiss Schnee. Snowshoe Shipping is an SDC subsidiary, meaning all the drones here report to the company, not the general. The pneumatic tubes allow for dust refined in the crater to be sent straight up to Atlas. We just need to find the one for the military base. Yang Shaolong. You know, that giant hound kicked us around like we were nothing. But Blake said you and the Chinese managed to take it down. Still having to one-up your big sis, huh? And the winner for best female character in a supporting role is... Yang Shaolong. You are being optimistic. Look, blind optimism isn't great. But no optimism means we've already lost. We need hope. We need to take risks. But mine didn't work. It's still got a warning out. Ruby, they're not called sure things. They're called risks. And in case you didn't notice, my plan for Mantle didn't work either. But we got Oscar back. And did a lot more that was never in the plan. Congratulations, Yang. I think that's a well-deserved win for this volume and everything that you had to go through. <laughs> yeah, you know, the whole, like, punching the undead witch in a personal area and falling into super hell. Quite a lot. Yeah, there's a lot that happened for Yang in this volume, but I think she really shone, even though she was obviously going through some things at some points. I'm, but sure, I'm sure this will mean a lot to her where she is, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, the first one to fall into super hell, I'm sure that this when <laughs> is gonna really make it all uh, worthwhile make it worthwhile hi everyone my name is sunny and i'm so excited to be here presenting a category at this year's oscars thank you so much to arnold and cal for inviting me to do this opportunity it's super exciting it's my first time doing it and there were some great categories this year it's a great volume so I'm super excited to see how this is all going to turn out. On my YouTube channel, I primarily do Ruby reactions, uh, probably why I'm here, of course. And yeah, I love Ruby. I love reacting to Ruby. It generates some really good emotions in me, and it's just a fun time to watch. And I also dabble in a few other anime-related topics and videos. Uh, for example, I have a pretty popular video where my boyfriend guesses characters from My Hero Academia, I do videos like that sometimes and it's really exciting and really fun. And IRL, I'm also into very different things, especially biology and research. So I have a quite interesting mix of things going on in my life. So I'm going to be presenting the category of Best Antagonist. So Best Antagonist was a category for this volume that I was actually super excited about and really excited to see 
who would be in the category and who might win the category because this volume was off the rails, let me tell you. I was loving the villains this volume. We got a huge range, character development, everything like that. So I'm very grateful also to be presenting this category. So without further ado, these are the nominees for Best Antagonist. Arthur Watts. What did you create in its stead? I merely added more flames to the fires of Atlas. Cinder Fall. Failed you again, Master. They used the staff to save thousands. Before our allies fell, Neapolitan killed Ruby. And before Ruby and her teammates fell, they used the lamp's final question. I, I couldn't stop them. I couldn't even stop the maiden from escaping without putting the relics in jeopardy. James Ironwood. I am going to do everything I can to defend this kingdom. What in God's name do you think you're doing, James? No matter the cost. And what's this about martial law? Have you lost your damn mind? Are you that scared of what you're doing? Neapolitan. Salem. Look how you've diminished. How you've lessened yourself. And for what? These children? This ruined world? Why do you keep coming back? And the Oscar for Best Antagonist goes to... Salem! In pursuit of a new world, no cost is too great. You've done well, Cinder. Our work here is done. Very exciting, oh my gosh. I'm so excited that Salem has won Best Antagonist this year. We got so much great Salem action in this volume. And wow, she's just a badass villain, let me tell you that. And I'm super excited to see her win Best Antagonist this volume. Also, shout out to her whale, RIP to that guy. He was pretty cool. But yeah, Salem takes the cake. I also thought Ironwood might be a contender in this category, but obviously people have spoken, and congrats to Salem for winning Best Antagonist. Ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived at the final award of the show. Ruby Volume 8 would not be the same without the leading characters whose strength and sacrifices carve a powerful, thought-provoking impression on the audience in a way that immortalizes them in discussions for volumes to come. These are the nominees for Best Leading Male Character. Hazel Reinhardt. When she came for me, I killed her over and over again. The longest she was gone was only a few hours before she put herself back together. When I couldn't lift my arms anymore, she showed me that through her, I could have the vengeance I needed. James Ironwood. I chased a lot of shadows over the years, always expecting betrayal. But never once did I think it would ever come from you. I know what's best for us, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get that staff. So, consider this my last order. Step aside. Jean Arc. Please, Winter, give us a chance to try to rescue him first. We... we could be your test run. You don't know what'll be waiting for you inside, right? So we can go ahead to check it out. And look for Oscar while we're inside. Lyren. No! No one is replaceable. You don't really believe that. You are furious about losing Clover. And you... You miss him. You don't... That's why you lost against Team Ruby. You... You try to fight how you feel about each other. 
so you'll never truly work as a team. Oscar Pine and Ospin. Nice story. But if Gretchen's death taught me one thing, it was never to trust you. Please, let me. But Oscar, you want him to trust us? And trust me. Her name is Jin. Huh? You want her to come out of the lamp? Just say her name. She can still answer one more question. After all that, you're just going to give Sam the password? No. I'm giving you the password. And hoping you'll find the truth for yourself. And the Oscar goes to... Oscar Pine and Ozpin, let's go! <laughs> he entrusted me with this, and the massive amount of power he had stored up in it. Kinetic energy that he spent lifetime after lifetime accumulating in the cane he built. So that's how you did that? Using all of the stored up power? Not all, but most. We have to be careful with how we use the rest. He trusted my judgment. And it saved us. I want to reciprocate that trust. There's a lot to sort out, but... Oz really wants to help. Thank you, Oscar. We finally did it, Reddit. Oscar won an Oscar. Let's go. I think Oscar winning this is... Um, I think he was a very new and improved version of himself especially with everything that he's gone through uh these last two volumes with confronting ironwood last volume uh pretty much confronting ozpin upon his return and really just kind of coming into his own as a character i don't know how this is going to fare with him um you know with the uh, eventual merging of of the two souls into one but um oscar definitely stood his own this volume uh he was his own person he made all the calls for himself ozpin really just let him take the reins um for all the decisions that he made and I, I think he definitely deserved this yeah i think that that's so true especially because oscar was really the driving force behind hazel and think about what would have happened if oscar was not able to kind of convert hazel at the last minute to their side right yeah, and yeah. so in a lot of ways like he made decisions that ozpin wouldn't have made and so he's becoming almost like a better, more trusting version of yeah. like what Ozpin, I think, has always wanted to be, but could never let himself be because he's just lived too long, you know? Like that's, he's lost that's so a good. lot of naivete, I guess, you know? And so yeah. now with Oscar, like he's a more simple and honest soul too, when you really think about it. It's not just Ruby, it's also Oscar and what he's able yeah. to do for Ozpin because of that. Yeah, uh, yeah, I love the way you put that. Like thinking about Oscar is just becoming a more optimized Ozpin. Um, yeah. And and I, I I love that. And I I think this is gonna make a lot of people happy because last yes. year was the <laughs> first Oscars that we ever did, and everyone was like, Oscar better win an Oscar, and I don't think he won anything. So. <laughs> well, I think this is well deserved. Yeah. This time. Congratulations, sure, so. Oscar Pine. And these are the nominees for best leading female character. Emerald Sustry. I highly doubt you're in the same place you started. I mean, yeah, you, you guys have been getting your asses kicked. Some of that my fault, but like, you're at war. You're gonna take hits. Look, I'm just going to be super pissed if you all finally decide to give up the moment I switch sides. Nora Valkyrie. Don't apologize. I got hurt doing what I always do. Just another ditzy move from Nora. That's not true. How would you know? We were supposed to be a team, but that didn't matter to you. When things went wrong, you pushed us away. You shut people out so you don't have to feel things that are hard. Penny Polandina. Hey. I do not like it when friends fight. I know. I... Yang and I might not agree on how best to save Mantle, no. but... No. I mean Winter. The General. They were our friends. But then the Aesops attacked you. And the General... He said people were going to die. Because of me. Ruby Rose. We shouldn't lie to ourselves. I wasted our time getting Amity up. Thinking help would come, but it didn't. And Amity fell. 
I was being childish. Winter Schnee! <laughs> you are going to pay for everything you've done! And the Oscar goes to... Drum roll! <laughs> I won't be gone. I'll be part of you. Good. I'm glad. I, for one, am really glad that Penny got this award, considering that this may be the final year that she is eligible. That's that's uh, a low blow. That's a low blow. The... That's a low blow. God damn it! I will not stand for this. Uh. But Penny had an amazing character <laughs> arc this volume. Obviously, that has wrapped up <laughs> in some respect. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I have some hopes that we may see her in volume nine, but this is not the video to talk about that. But uh. Penny has such growth such de like development in her uh in her personality and her wants and everything that went into like those final moments and final decisions how she was able to sacrifice herself for her yeah. friends and deciding that that was the route that she wanted to go despite the life that they gave her you know what i mean and so yeah. i feel like that overall penny had a really satisfying arc for me this season yeah uh no pun intended but i love how they humanized her so much like even from her <laughs> Her inception even from like her debut in volume one we were always like immediately drawn to the fact that despite her being made of nuts and bolts instead of squishy guts it didn't make her any less real uh than someone like ruby and um you know having her back in volume seven i think reinforced to a lot of people who might not have had um the time necessary to build an attachment to Penny during the Beacon arc. Um, I think they not only reinforced that, but pretty much put the nail in the coffin. No, again, no pun intended. <laughs> uh, put the nail in the yeah, coffin for, for, like for really establishing Penny as a, like a bona fide character. Um, yeah, and so many people I think loved Penny more because yeah, of these past two absolutely, seasons. So absolutely. It, I think that a lot of people at first they were like, they're bringing Penny back like they were a little hesitant about the idea but then yeah. as you see her in volume 7 and in volume 8 I think a lot of people grew to love her in a way that they didn't necessarily love her before and then so to have her taken away from us right hurt even more than I think it ever did in volume yeah. 3. I, I think in a way that also immortalizes the character right like like uh, for some characters they're really defined by how they go out you know, like Pyrrha yeah. made a noble sacrifice. Penny did the same thing. And that's a part of the human experience to some degree. You know, dying for your loved ones or sacrificing yourself, I should say, for your loved ones, whether it's a parent and child um, or even in this case, friends. And I think Penny um, pretty much established that the one choice that she had, this is what I want to do with my life. And despite it being yeah. cut short, I think that um, that made her a, a forever loved character uh, for sure. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, the Ruby Volume 8 Oscars Awards show has come to a close. We really hope you guys enjoyed uh, all of the work and effort that has gone into this. Uh, a big shout out to uh, everybody that has helped collaborate on this effort together. We started this during the halfway point of the volume and just seeing everybody's individual submissions come together with the editing and, and everything else in between uh, was really great to put together. Yes, it was a pleasure doing this with our fellow Ruby tubers. Make sure that you guys check them out. They will all have links in the description down below. And you guys should also check out the artist that made our thumbnail, Keith. Oh yeah, His Keith. His will be down below too. And Thank so you, you guys can go commission him and all of that that stuff uh, you know for all your oc pokemon ruby type needs he does a lot of different like oc work and everything like that yeah. so if that's something you're interested in you should definitely check him out and we will be here continuing to entertain you with videos or with art during the ruby volume 8 hiatus and yeah. thank you to everyone who voted watch and we will see you next time bye